Uh, this is uh, Wednesday, October 30th, 1919. 2019. <laughs> 20, 2019. Mm -hmm. uh, this is Connell O'Donovan uh, with Patty Reagan. Doc, Dr. Patricia Reagan. Do you have a middle name? Patricia Ann. Patricia Ann. Patricia Ann Reagan. What year were you born? 19. Oh, what's your birthday? Sorry. I am. I was born September twenty second, nineteen forty nine, in Lima, Peru. My parents were with the State Department, and I was there for five years before we moved back to the oh states. So yo hablo un poco de español. Qué bueno. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what's, what's your father's name? My father is Jerome Hamilton Reagan, okay. and he's from Washington D.C. My mother is Martha Jane Hill from Franklin, Idaho. Okay. Both Mormon? No, my father was a lapsed Catholic, okay. and my mother was Mormon. They met in Peru, and uh, were married there. Okay. How many siblings do you have? I had three brothers: Gary, Gary Jerome, George Michael, and Terry Martin. And are they older, younger? They are all younger. I'm okay. the oldest of the four of us. Oh, okay. wow. Um, where did you go to high school? I went to East Denver High School, which was an amazing place. It was a very integrated high school, and I know that really a lot of who I am today is because of my experiences in high school and, and the diversity, living, being among the racial diversity in high school in the 60s. Okay, awesome. Uh, where did, and college education, where'd you go? <laughs> what to, degrees did you get? I have... Uh, a BS and an MS from Brigham Young University, a PhD from the University of Illinois Champaign-Urbana, an MPH from UC Berkeley. What's MPH? Master of Public Health. Oh, okay. From Berkeley? From Berkeley. When, when did you go to Berkeley? Much too late. I wish I'd been there <laughs> in the 60s. I was there in 1984 to 85. Okay. Uh, when did you graduate from BYU? I, As it with your bachelor's? My bachelor's, I think, in uh, 71 or 72. Okay. And then the next year I finished my master's. Okay. That's it. That's all we have to That's it then. Yeah. Hello. Welcome. I'm Becky Moss. I have the privilege of being an auxiliary kind of member of the Queer Historical Society. We got it up and going here because the Pride Center, this amazing Pride Center, exists. And the Queer Historical Society, I'd like to say Ben has helped, Ben Williams helped to get it going and stuff. We've got people running here. Connell takes care of this section, and I, I just get to hang out with him and cuss him out on a regular basis because somebody has to be, you know, available for dykes when we're mean. But Connell's on his way. But monthly, we try to have at least one of these oratories with audiences. Because with the audience, when you do this oratory, we have interaction and we can get, maybe get people to tell more than they would have remembered. So towards the end, go ahead, ask questions. It's fun. Now, if you're the kind of person, first of all, we're all we want to get as many stories as we can because our stories are important. We are basically the first generation of LGBT people who in mass said this is who we are. It's never happened like that before. We are amazing and we need our stories. If you're not comfortable with an audience, let us know anyway. We want to tape your stories. But if you are comfortable with audience, we're always looking for it. So next month, we're going to do it a week early. We're not going to do it the night before Thanksgiving. We'll do it the week before that and it'll be Walter Larrabee. Now, keeping it short and sweet, I wanted to tell you my perception of Dr. Patty Reagan. I started hearing this rumor of a professor up at the University of Utah who gave a human sexuality class that was out of this world. And we, everybody's talking about it and we, think, and we would try to see if we could sneak in and audit the class, but her classes were already overflowing and they, were, they would pr make you prove that you were there so you couldn't sneak in. And the other thing is in the lesbian community, they were, the rumors were that she was one of us. And the agreement was that even if she wasn't, she should be, because somebody that amazing should be LGBT. <laughs> <laughs> and then Patty, also we've had in here, we've talked in this group about um, the importance in the AIDS crisis, about how the lesbians also were being as strongly affected by AIDS because our, our friends were dying. We were the ones who were, 
we were giving the hugs without having barriers and we were kissing and our the men in our lives we were saying this we're not going to get this disease by being around the gay men but we were losing our friends and the lesbians were doing this and then patty Ray, dr patty reagan went that big huge step further uh, aids project utah was starting to get in trouble and things weren't really working as well and she started the Salt Lake AIDS Foundation, which is now the Utah AIDS Foundation. And that's all I'm going to tell of my perception of this amazing woman, other than one other really important part. I had the privilege of interviewing her on the Concerning Gays and Lesbians program for a short a series. And it was the most educational, wonderful series. And for all of us who had tried to get into her classroom and couldn't get in there, we had it on tape. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Thank Patty. you, Vicky. I kind of wish someone would have told me I was a lesbian before you people knew. <laughs> that, that was came as sort of a surprise to me, sort of late in the game. I've been retired from the university for uh, over 20 years, almost 20 some years now, and I have not given a public speech in, in all those years, so bear with me. Uh, so, I think Becky just told me it's like riding a bike. Who told me that? Ben. Ben told me it was like riding a bike, so here we go. We're riding, we're riding this together. Um, I wanted to talk about my, my piece of the puzzle here in Utah. And I needed to start sort of where Becky was alluding to at BYU. Little do a lot of people know I, went, I was a Mormon and I went to BYU. Or a, I met Mona when she was but a child. <laughs> and uh, it was a really horrible experience. <laughs> I just was so unhappy, and I could never figure out exactly why. But I just knew it just, I, it did not compute. And uh, I left for a while, and I actually joined the CIA, like from BYU to CIA. Like, I'm going to be happy there. And. I came back because I knew I had to get an education. I had to finish my degree. And the reason I went there was, oh, I think I'll just tell you a quick story. I went there because my Mormon bishop told me that I would get a scholarship for leadership. I was the student body president of my high school in Denver, Colorado. And I went to BYU and I went to the scholarship office and they said, and I said, my bishop said to come in and pick up my scholarship. And they said, oh, we don't give those to girls. We only give them to boys. That was sort of the beginning of my <laughs> descent into unhappiness at BYU. But I stuck it out because I knew I needed an education, and I got a teaching certificate, and I needed a minor. I was in sociology. And so I picked up health education, and I loved it. I realized I just loved health and health education. It was practical. It was kind of, I took a first aid class. It was hands-on. And so that really was what brought me to the AIDS Foundation, ultimately, which brought me to human sexuality, ultimately, which brought me all to right now, today, <laughs> ultimately. When I, and I wanted to read you, I, the things that made me Patty Reagan and part of your, his, your history are the people in my life and the books in my life. And... I, um, I wanted to read you some passages from some of the poetry that has really made me realize who I am and where I'm going and why I'm here. And this one is, unfortunately it's lost, but I have no idea where it is. Okay. Well, I know where it is, 159. Um, <laughs> I'll be calm in a few minutes. I just have to get back in. This is... Uh, these are some lines from a poem called Journeys of the Mind by the lesbian Ann Walters, who is a Seminole Cherokee. And this is sort of, I realized when I read this, how BYU affected me and made me as angry as I was. You cannot extricate my Indianness, my Jewishness, my lesbianness. You cannot reach in and exercise that pain or joy. You can dress me in your clothes, cut my hair, make up my face, put heeled shoes on my feet, and force me to paint a smile on my face. But I won't forget. I remember. Because Indians and Jews and lesbians don't forget. In the second cycle, I, taught, I, I am taught contradictory values, forced to assimilate. 
The third cycle begins with alienated confusion. In the third cycle, I try to sort out what is and what is not mine. After five months of reclaiming, re-knowing, re-remembering, I pick up the pieces and finding myself, I emerge. No longer a victim of my own self-destruction, I am a lesbian of color who refuses to be washed out. <laughs> and that's sort of how I began to realize BYU was ruining me. <laughs> I went on for a PhD later to the University of Illinois. And it, this was in 1973. The first women's studies class was started at UC San Diego in 1972. But a lot of universities were beginning to pick up women's studies and uh, realizing that women needed to have voice. And I took a women's studies class, Women in Politics, and I was introduced to a lot of literature again and a lot of authors who began to change my life. I also met my first feminist. She was a graduate student who shared the office with me. Her name was Patty Riddle, Patty Reagan and Patty Riddle. And I was also assigned as a graduate student to teach human sexuality. Now remember, I just came from BYU. <laughs> I knew nothing, absolutely zippo. And um, so I'd read a chapter ahead, and then I'd go in and ask Patty Riddle, what the hell does this mean? What and she'd say, oh, Patty. <laughs> and um, she would assist me, and not literally, but, uh, and uh, I learned to teach, I did sex education day by day. Sorry, Becky, didn't mean to arrive. <laughs> The other thing that was happening in 1973 while I was at the University of Illinois was <coughs> the Equal Rights Amendment, which was happening during feminism. And I'm just going to read you the Equal Rights Amendment. Equality of rights under the law shall not be abridged by the United States or by any state on account of sex. That's the Equal Rights Amendment. <laughs> and it started off great, and it didn't take long before people who I will talk about in a few moments destroyed the, the passage of the ERA as an amendment to the Constitution. And part of what destroyed it were people in Utah. They were a major force here. But um, the discussions around the ERA, my taking a women's studies class, meeting Patty Riddle, I began to learn about feminism. And Feminism gave me language. It gave me the words to describe my anger about BYU. Words like patriarchy and oppression and having no voice. The other thing that happened in the 1970s was Sonia Johnson, who is a piece of our history. And I'm still trying to be a Mormon. And Sonia Johnson, who was a Mormon from Virginia, as you, I'm sure all of you know, was excommunicated from the Mormon Church because of her absolute belief in the Equal Rights Amendment. And it was at that point I thought, again, how can an organization excommunicate a human being for wanting equal rights? And that was sort of, again, something that made me realize that I, I wasn't a very good Mormon. Um, I also swore I would never come back to Utah. If I had to go to like California, I would go by way of Mexico or Canada. Anything to not come from Utah. Yeah. But in 1978, when I finished my PhD and was unemployed, I was looking for a job in health. And um, I graduated in December with my PhD. And that's a bad time to be looking for academic jobs. But there was, in the Chronicle of Higher Education, where they advertise those kind of jobs, there was an opening for a health education instructor at the University of Utah, and I thought, oh, God hates me. <laughs> but it, I thought, at least it's not Provo. <laughs> so maybe I can do this. So I came to Utah. And since I had been a human sexuality instructor, expert, of course, I, was, I decided to start a human sexuality, I took the job, I decided to start the human sexuality course, which Becky kept trying to sneak into, for, uh, at, here at Utah. And what I realized at this point, which I want to tell you, and um, Joni, I have a job for you. I want you to hang this on here. Can you do that? Yeah. All right, you're on that. I realized that I'm not alone in this process. 
and that nobody can be part of history without everybody like you. And that it takes a village, and that there are the village people who have made a huge difference in my life. And in 1978 or 9, actually it was 78, I had just gotten here, I was teaching this human sexuality, and someone knocked on my door one day, and it was Louise Canal. And Louise was, actually I think she was cruising. She was cruising new faculty on campus. <laughs> yeah. And uh, she knocked on my door, and we went and had macaroni and cheese in the students, but never mind, some building where, where the maintenance workers were. And I was really intrigued by Louise. She was a historian at the university, uh, associate professor of history. And I just realized that I needed to know Louise in many ways. And however, she said, when she was, talked to me and realized who I was, she told me that she, there was no way she was going to be friends with a Mormon who ate marshmallows in green jello. <laughs> and that that was like the killer. Hi, Lucy. <laughs> I didn't see you come in. And, um, and, but I kept trying. And finally, Louise gave me some hands-on human sexuality, which was very helpful, <laughs> because I'd just been teaching by the book and not by anything I knew. And she also introduced me to the New York Times and to uh, women's studies on campus. We were just starting women's studies at the University of Utah. And women's studies was like wonderful. All of a sudden I met these other wonderful and amazing women. Derek Gillespie, Deborah Burrington, Stephanie Pace, Melanie Cherry, and there were others, and they were brilliant, and they were lesbians, <laughs> and they were, they were just the most fascinating women I had ever met. And so, and they let my human sexuality class become part of the women's studies program. So I became part of the women's studies program. The other thing in the 70s that was important was the Women's Resource Center. I don't think you realize how important the Women's Resource Center was um, to the gay community, to lesbians in particular, to all of us. And every year they would have Women's Week with lots of workshops and, and speakers and wonderful events. And the people at the Women's Resource Center, Shauna Adix was the director, Anne Nicole, she was the counselor there, Jane Edwards, who became the director of the YWCA, and Kay Coleman worked there as a therapist also. But, um, and the Women's Resource Center and the Women's, well, we didn't really have a Women's Studies program, we just had classes. But through the Women's Resource Center, we started the Women's Studies program. And um, I also began reading a whole lot more. I was introduced to lesbian, radical lesbians, like Andrea Dworkin, Audre Lorde, and I heard that your speaker last month, month was uh, Patrick Khalifa. Yeah. He, she, they used to be Pat Khalifa, which was the first book I ever read. She wrote Sapphistry, which was the first lesbian sexuality book. That was so helpful. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I'm sorry I didn't get to see them. Does, do you think he, he, she goes by them? them. It's so hard with pronouns. I think yes. him. No, he goes uh, by he. Is by he, does he? Okay, oh. thanks. You're welcome. Hi. <laughs> Sorry. I'm okay. Late. No, no, it's okay. I am always late. No, actually, I'm neurotically early, always. <laughs> um, we kind of made it through the 70s, and then came 1981. I'm moving through uh, the decades rather rapidly. In June, on June 5th, 1981, the MMWR, which is the Morbidity and Mortality Weekly Report, had this, I'm going to read you a piece of it. It was titled, Pneumocystis Pneumonia, Los Angeles. In the period October 1980 through May 1981, five young men, all active homosexuals, were treated for biopsy-confirmed pneumocystis carini pneumonia at three different hospitals in Los Angeles. Two of the patients died. That was in June. I'm a little nervous. <laughs> okay, in a second. Sorry. Breathe. <laughs> Breathe, that's good. In September 24th of the same year, the CDC 
first used the word AIDS, which stands for Acquired Immune Deficiency. There, by June until September, there were 600 cases. 76% were homosexual and bisexual males. 41% were dead. By December of that year, we had realized that AIDS could be transferred by blood transfusions and perinatal transmission. By 1983, we, in January, the CDC reported that female partners of people with HIV and AIDS were being infected. IV drug users were being infected. Hemophiliacs were being infected. They also reported that there was no inanimate transition, transmission. So you weren't getting this by shaking hands, sitting down on a chair. The National AIDS Hotline was then set up, and people began calling. In 1980, and all this time, there were a lot of horrible things happening, of course, you know that. But in 1984, something pivotal happened in my life. I received a sabbatical, and I went to UC Berkeley on my sabbatical to get a postdoc, Master of Public Health. UC Berkeley had just received a $1 million grant to do an epidemiological study in the Castro, because that was the epicenter of the epidemic. And so almost all of my classes at UC Berkeley were related to HIV AIDS. Um, it, was, it was amazing. I, I was learning everything they were learning at the same time, which wasn't much. None of us knew much. But it was exciting, and I got to go to the Castro quite a bit and do part of the research there. During this time, there was not one word from Ronald Reagan, who was president and no relation. Um, <laughs> there were many attacks on homosexual men, and there was talk of quarantining, gay, of the quarantine of gay men, um, and other horrible things happening. There was a, I wanted to also tell you, in, in addition to the, do I have this down? Well, I'll put this on. There were also the village idiots. <laughs> okay, thanks. And among the village illegal, it's it's tricky, but not a, not important. Don't look there. Now everyone look there. Um, one of the village idiots was Peter Duesberg. Peter Duesberg was an epidemiology. I mean, a microbiology micro. Biologist. Biologist, yeah, at Berkeley. And he was, and he wrote a, a document that said <laughs> that HIV, I mean that AIDS was not caused by HIV, that it was part of a cancer thing, anyway. Um, and I wanted to just, and he set us back quite a ways during that time. Max Essex has written of Peter Duesenberg, History will judge Duesberg as either a nut who is just a tease to the scientific community or an enabler of mass murder for the deaths of many AIDS patients, particularly in Africa. And it's true. He was, and people believed him. Some people believed him, not Fauci or the CDC or people who knew what was going on. So I finished my year at UC Berkeley and I came home. And someone had given me a book, another book of poetry, by the lesbian, the Greek lesbian, Olga Bromis. And among, in, within this book, there was a line that I read. And she said, I am a woman who understands the necessity of an impulse, whose origin or goal still lie beyond me. And that's sort of what happened when I got back. I had the necessity of an impulse. And I knew, I'm a health educator, I just was, I guess I'm gay. <laughs> I, I just learned a lot about HIV AIDS and I've got to do something. And so I, well, I started speaking and I began doing what I do. I'm a health educator. I tried educating and I started passing out condoms in the bars and I started 
just being on panels. I went to the nursing school and to various educational, I mean medical groups, and tried to speak about what I had learned, again, which wasn't much. And I started getting a lot of, and as my name kind of got out there, I started getting a lot of calls at my office of people who were freaked out, men and women, who wanted to know more, who were terrified, who were afraid that they were at risk or that they might be infected. And it became kind of overwhelming at my office at the university to be taking all these calls. And one day I was, one of my doctoral students, Sandra Bagley, who was back on the village people. <coughs> oh, we can put the village people back. I mean, we can put the, oh, no, this will work. Oh, Sandra Bagley. You know, I've been practicing this for months. <laughs> I still don't know if it'll work. Um, and she was in my office when I got a call from someone who needed some information. And Sandra Bagley was working, she was a nurse who also started the Utah Women's Clinic, which was an abortion clinic in Utah. It was one of the first abortion clinics. And she said to me, you know, I've got a phone with a bunch of lines open on it. And if you'd like, I'll give you one of the lines and you can start taking HIV calls and AIDS questions at the clinic. And she said, all you have to do is pay for the line. And I said, wow, okay. <laughs> so I paid for a line and we opened up what I, and then I decided it needed a name, not Patty Reagan's telephone line. And so the, the most prominent AIDS organization in the country was the San Francisco AIDS Foundation which was the first AIDS foundation in the country to do this. And I just stole the name, essentially, and named us the Salt Lake AIDS Foundation. And a lot of my undergraduate university students had to do internships. So I would send my interns <coughs> from my health education program down to the Utah Women's Clinic, and they answered the line. And among those people, I don't know if I have them up there, were, um, they're on there somewhere, were, um, <laughs> Christine Wimmer and Lori Gregory. They were the first two. There was a young man, too, and I just couldn't remember his name. Um, oh, I have their names right there. One of the other, I mentioned Audre Lorde earlier, and one of the things that Audre Lorde said in one of her uh, poems, your silence will not protect you. Whether we speak or not, the machine will crush us, and we will also be afraid. Our silence will not protect us. And I realized at that time that I had to keep speaking out. Even though it wasn't easy, the village idiots were on my tail and were giving me a hard time. I wanted to share one other little poem piece with you. This is written by, it's, uh, it's a poem called Prisons of Sil Silence by Janice Mirakantani. And it's about her She's Japanese, and it's about the World War II U.S. concentration camps of Japanese Americans. But when I read this, it also motivated me in the work I was doing at that time. The strongest prisons are built with walls of silence. Abandoned homes, confiscated land, loyalty oaths, barbed wire prisons in a strange wasteland. Go home, Jap. Where is home? All persons of Japanese ancestry filthy Jap, both alien and non-aliens, to be incarcerated for their own good. Where is home, a country of betrayal? From this cell of history, this mute grave, we birth our rage. We give testimony, our noise is dangerous, we beat our hands like wings healed, we soar from these walls of silence. And that became the most important part of the 80s in the late 80s, when no one, when everyone was silent, the government was silent, Ronald Reagan was silent, the state was silent. So I did more public speaking. <laughs> I decided the more the better. There were some problems. The biggest problem... That's right there. Right there. Gail Ruzica, who has been with us forever. It's like she was followed me around like a bad shadow or something. And um, she went to the, first of all, she went to the state and told the state that I w should be arrested for, because I was breaking Utah law. In Utah, we weren't allowed to teach about sexual intercourse, we weren't condoms, abortion, 
homosexuality, the intricacies of sex, those were all part of the law. I was breaking every one of them in so many ways, and publicly, in the schools, on panels, everywhere. And so, I want to say, though, one of the heroes in this whole episode of my life was the University of Utah. They always protected my ap academic freedom, not always happily. <laughs> I know I drove them crazy, but they always protected me, and they always said, no, you have a right. You, as an academic and as a professor, you have a right to say these things. And what you do outside the university is your own business, essentially. The other person that was really problematic was Craig Nichols. Craig Nichols was the state epidemiologist. And he and I ended up on the same panels all the time. And every and he was I think <laughs> never mind, I'm not gonna say this. But he would tell everyone that what I was saying was wrong. I was telling everyone to use condoms. That was sort of the only, that's the only thing we knew, really. It was the only major preventive that we kind of knew. And he would publicly say no, that it was immoral to use condoms, and that no, they weren't going to help. It was just frustrating. And he was the state epidemiologist. Um, the LDS Church, as, as you might guess, was a problem. But I put an asterisk here. Because every once in a while, they kind of come through. And I, I want to acknowledge that, perhaps in just a little bit. But they were, um, they were telling people not to let me in and not to help. I was invited by health educators in many of the junior highs and high schools to come speak. And it only took once before I was banned. <laughs> but Granite High School and um, Jane Jensen, it was either Ellen or Jane, they're twins and I can never tell which one it is, but had invited me there a couple times and to give talks. And I was, parents complained that I was talking about all these things they didn't want their children to hear about, which is like HIV AIDS. And so I was banned by the Granite School District. I wanted to tell you a story about Orem High. And I brought this little show and tell because I ended up in Playboy magazine, and, this, and I, I framed myself, sort of. In uh, 1986 or so, I want to just read you this. Members of the senior class of Orem High School in Alpine asked their sociology teacher, Pamela Leatham, who's Pamela Child on my village people, for AIDS education. Leatham was smart enough to solicit parents' approval, which they gave enthusiastically before she asked, asked Dr. Patricia Reagan, one of Utah's foremost AIDS experts, <laughs> Good thing they didn't want sex education <laughs> to instruct their students. Easy enough so far, until Leatham was informed that the school district's policy on AIDS states that teachers or lecturers must not discuss the sex, the sex act or prevention of pregnancy by artificial means, whether in discussing human reproduction or transmission and prevention of AIDS, or any social disease, and must not use the word condom in any context. At that, Dr. Reagan replied, I'm a health educator. I'm not sure I can talk about AIDS without mentioning condoms. Well, the Tribune did a, badly did a cartoon. And there's this little funny looking person behind a podium, as I am now still, funny looking, that says, if a couple does the S word without using a C word, uh, they could contract the deadly A word. There, I hope that clears up any confusion there might be from your filthy little minds. <laughs> and Playboy magazine picked it up and I made the centerfold of Playboy. Okay, a little drink. Once you're a centerfold, always a centerfold. Um, well, things grew. The Salt Lake Ages Foundation grew. And uh, at that time, Becky mentioned AIDS Project Utah. AIDS Project Utah was sort of our sister organization. They were doing sort of the service end of providing <laughs> resources, food, um, counseling. I was doing the education end, and they were doing the services. But they were having some financial problems, I think. Ben Barr was their, I don't think he was the director, but he worked with AIDS Project Utah. I am just a school teacher. I had no idea how to keep the Salt Lake AIDS Foundation afloat. It was costing money, 
and it, the little bit it was costing was coming out of my pocket, and I honestly am incapable of asking people for money. It's just, I just can't do it. And so I was going to fold the foundation, and Ben Barr called me when he heard I was going to fold it, and he, we went to lunch, and he said, if you'll give me the foundation, I'll take it, and I'll, I'll make it work. And I said, honey, it's all yours. <laughs> and, and he did. He was fantastic. And Ben took the Salt Lake AIDS Foundation. Well, and AIDS Project Utah closed up. And so the Salt Lake AIDS Foundation started picking up where the AIDS Project Utah had to leave off with counseling, food, financial resources, and services. And this is where I wanted to just kind of mention the LDS Church for a second. Ben told me this story, that one day the, well, there was a lot going on in the LDS church because many of their members had HIV AIDS. Many of the men, of course, not many, but some were bisexual men who were coming up to the sun and becoming infected. And the Mormon church was really, con they were really concerned and they cared. Mostly they cared for their reputation. <laughs> they didn't want everyone to know that, that their people were getting HIV AIDS. But, in fact, it was during that time, Rocky, was it Lynn Harward? Was that his first name? They excommunicated. Claire. Claire. Claire Harward. And I, I couldn't remember his first name to get him on my list of village people. But one of the most public negative responses by the LDS Church was they excommunicated a man who had AIDS, and it, it raised an uproar into everyone was livid. How could they, I mean, pack on the pain and horror of this whole episode? Well, that gave the church such negative publicity that they kind of began to realize they needed to clean up their act a little bit. And they actually gave $10,000 to the Salt Lake AIDS Foundation, but they made us swear that we would never tell anyone that they did it. <laughs> so. Behind the scenes, every once in a while, they realized they needed to get involved in health. And I wanted to also give them a little credit. During this time, the epidemic became so great that the Utah Health Department started the AIDS Coalition. And the AIDS Coalition was, uh, there were about 20 members. And we represented all the organizations and all the groups in Salt Lake. Well, not even in Salt Lake, in the Wasatch area. Some were from Ogden, were coming down too. And we met once a month to try to coordinate our resources and coordinate the work we were doing with HIV AIDS. One of the things that was kind of nifty about the AIDS Coalition was Microsoft donated Mac computers to everyone in the coalition, so we could synchronize, and this was pretty early with computers, this was like the end of the 80s, and to be honest, I never did figure out how to use that computer. I had been a Windows person forever, and, and it was tricky. But they, but Microsoft, I mean not Microsoft, Apple. Apple, Apple. thank you, Lucy. <laughs> Apple gave us these Mac computers so that we could coordinate. We never really used them, but I thought that was pretty great. But one of the things the LDS Church, they sent a representative. I just remember his first name was Jim. He never said much, but he was there at every meeting, and he was very invested in trying to help coordinate all the resources in town. And I, I, I really appreciated that uh, they were that involved. Um, Patty? Yes? I wonder if Carolyn Pearson had an impact, too, with um, writing Goodbye, I Love You in 1986. Well. Of course she did. <laughs> I mean, Carolyn Pearson was a Mormon, is a, is a Mormon poet, who's, wasn't her son? Her, her husband. husband. Her husband, that's right. You'll have to remind me. Um, and was she excommunicated also, eventually? I don't think so. I think she always stayed active and very good. But yeah, Carolyn Pearson's book, Goodbye, I Love You, oh yeah, it was about her husband. It's coming to me now. Um, was. It didn't impact me that much, I, maybe because I was kind of angry at the Mormons, and regardless of what they were doing. But yeah, good country. Thank you for adding that. And feel free to add your pieces of the puzzle. Um, there were a lot of other things going on that I wanted to acknowledge. And 
Are the village people? Oh yeah, they're back here. Sandbag, the royal court. Royal court was really important. They gave me $500 when I was beginning to have a problem keeping the phone line up because I just didn't have the money. And I really, and they said, we, they wrote a check for $500 and said this is to help you keep the line up. Joe Redburn, of course, at The Sun, Nikki Boyer, they were all doing programs and they were collecting food and they were distributing and they were uh, very active. ACLU. The ACLU took a legal case that there was, I um, can't remember all the particulars, but there was a law that said I couldn't be passing out the condoms. I couldn't even be talking about condoms, as you saw with this Orem thing. And ACLU took it to court and won and said yes, that this is a health issue and that we could win. And so I really appreciate Carol Gennady and then Kate Kendall. The ACLU is very important. Becky Moss. And Troy both had their radio shows and did interview me. I was much more articulate then, <laughs> I think. Can I? I would need to interject real quick. Please. So after we did the program, we aired it for a while. I got a phone call and I was told I had to come down to the station. We had a big problem. And I got down there and there were investigators, people in uniform, and they were accusing me of inter interviewing Dr. Patty Reagan and that she had gotten on my radio program and it had been reported that she had announced some terrible things about <laughs> that horrible, the, the health department guy. Oh, I had and they used said, his name in vain? You'd said something. <laughs> whatever they said Oops. at the time, <clears throat> my memory was much better there. But I said no, nothing like that was said. And they said, well, we have people saying it. And I said, well, let's go get the tapes. And they shut up and left. They didn't even listen to the oh, tapes. Darn. I didn't even know that. <laughs> That's very interesting. Well, I'm sure I, I'm sure I mentioned him because he was wrong. Ben? Um, Patty, whenever I uh, share your story about things, I always bring up of your mother. So please bring up your mother. Well, <laughs> Mom is the one that donated the money. I mean, I didn't have any money, really. And it was my mother who knew, who was, who was an active Mormon. And she said, let me help. And so she actually paid for the uh, phone for a, a few months before I was able to, to do it myself. I just want to also say about mom, I ran for the legislature in 1983 or 4. Lucy was like my campaign manager. <laughs> Thank you, Lucy. We lost, but not by much. And Francis Farley, do you remember Francis? Yeah. Francis. Francis Farley told me, there's no way you can win this election if you don't wear a skirt. A skirt. I don't own a skirt. And so my mother also sent me money for a skirt and a house. <laughs> I still lost, damn it. But uh yeah, thanks, Ben. Yeah, mom mom was great and she was she just was always very supportive. I didn't put mom on the village people. Um needless to say, Kristen Reese and Maggie Snyder are mega. Uh I did not know Kristen. But I was re making referrals to Kristen. We had not met. I did not meet Kristen until I got mononucleosis from wearing myself out <laughs> and needed an in, uh, infectious disease expert and, and went to her as a professional. Becky, could you just open that door? I think I need a little air. <laughs> and um, uh, I took, yeah, thanks. Just tell her to blow a little cold air in here because I'm full of hot air, clearly. <laughs> but. Um, Kristen was the, as you all know, was the only, really what, the only, if maybe there was one, but know, physician in town, she probably was the only one who was taking AIDS patients. And partly it's the same reason why I was doing the education. We were trained to do our job, and we were, we had a moral commitment to what we knew how to do. Maggie Snyder was my student, and uh, I'm not exactly sure how you teamed up, but Maggie's a health educator and then became a PA and uh, put all her educational background together and did that. Um, the, I wanted to acknowledge David Sharpton. David Sharpton was one of the first most visible people with AIDS in Salt Lake and there were many others but David was not embarrassed. David went forth and spoke and talked about his infection, and talked about his disease, and 
and was just important to all of us. There was also, what was Barb's last name? Barnhart. Barnhart. Barb Barnhart, one of the very first women to publicly acknowledge and die from HIV AIDS. And uh, yeah, she was special. There were, of course, there were many, many, but those two impacted me in major ways. And I didn't know them well, but I, I honor their courage. Um, one of my other speaking engagements, briefly, was I was invited, people, people were worried about their children. People were worried that children were going to become infected. So Uinta Elementary invited me to be a speaker, and they invited parents and children. I'm not very sensitive to the fact that I usually speak to adult audiences. And um, this was a huge event. Their little auditorium was filled, and the, news, uh, the TV stations were there, the news stations. And during my discussion, I uh, held up a condom to describe this. Well, that night I got a call from someone, it may have been from you, Lucy, and they said, you better turn on Channel 4. <laughs> so I turned on Channel 4, and they were saying, Dr. Patty Reagan <laughs> spoke to the people at Uinta Elementary and held up this condom. And it looked like it went on a bull elephant. <laughs> it had zoomed in on this condom that just looked massive. And the, the, I can't remember his name, but he was the, the newscaster. And he said, oh, Dr. Reagan will never be speaking in this town again. <laughs> and I didn't do much after that. Uh, but the voids were filled by many others. And in fact, after Ben took over the Salt Lake AIDS Foundation and many other organizations came to the rescue, I did leave uh, my work with AIDS. But I started an AIDS education class at the university, um, and I also got more involved in women's studies. And I want to acknowledge Shelley White, which is on another page of this event. I got more involved in women's studies. And Shelley White was my administrative assistant when I was the director of Women's Studies. And she gave me this book as a gift, Making Face, Making Soul, from which I am reading a number of passages. And it really is like my Bible. It changed my life. I want to also say that two weeks before Rocky asked me to give this, I donated all my books to the library. I cleaned my bookshelves, and I had to go back to the library and check out all these books that I had been using. And naturally, none of them were underlined where I had underlined my own personal books in use. So I've, for the last month, I've been researching and redoing my whole life. Um, I also really realized in the 90s who I am. I'm a feminist, I'm an academic, I'm a health educator, I'm an ex-Mormon, I'm a professor, I'm a survivor. I, and there's a Native American concept that says the soul speaks, the body acts. And I just think that throughout the decades that I've been doing this, my soul has been speaking and, and my Olga Bromus impulses have been making me act. Um, let me read you. Let's not. <laughs> I'll do it later. One of the things, just real briefly, that I did. Are we tired yet? We're okay. Uh, I had a friend named Lynn Duran, and Lynn and I went to the West Coast Women's Music Festival. I don't know if you had a chance to go. It was fantastic. It was in near Yosemite, and we listened to Holly Near and Chris Williamson and Meg Christian and and who were as much part of my Bible as this book. <laughs> and when Lynn and I got back, we said, oh, we've got to bring this music to Utah. And so Lynn and I organized and produced a women's music concert at Kingsbury Hall. And it was one of the only women's music festivals that I think we've ever had in Utah. And we uh, brought in uh, some comics and some of the uh, Deirdre McCalla and a number of musicians who had been at the West Coast Women's Music Festival. And I just have to tell you a quick story. We were all standing out in front of Kingsbury, and these women came, and they had um, brown paper bags over their heads. And I finally <laughs> said, what's going on? And they said, we don't want anyone to know we're here. It was still really hard to be out 
to be visible, to, and they wanted to be at the music festival. And I'm just so glad I, you know, that we did the music festival and that they came, even with their brown paper bags over their heads. One of the things that um, I realized in all my travels is that you have to be subversive to get the message across sometimes. And I created in the, and I want to thank Oni Grosshands, who was the chair of my department. And she always, I drove her crazy too, but she always gave me permission to, to do what I needed to do. And so she let me start a diversity and health class, which was part of the diversity program at the university. And for the diversity and health class, um, I decided to be subversive. All of, almost all of the readings were written by lesbians of color. <laughs> I decided that people needed to hear those voices. And so we used um, Home Girls by, um, who wrote Home Girls? Anyway, Black Feminist Anthology, which has a number of things. And we used Making Face, Making Soul, and many other readings that I had at the, on reserve at the library. So almost everything we read were by lesbians of color, so that they would have voice and visibility. There were other things going on in Salt Lake that were subversive. There was the Lesbian Terrorist and, and Sewing Society. Was that what it was called? It was from Logan. Were they in Logan? Oh, I, there, there was a chapter here, because I knew some... Thelma and Louise Lesbian Terrorist and Sewing Circle. <laughs> the sewing Circle, yes. The Thelma and Louise... Lesbian Terrorists and Sewing Circle. Yes. And then I got in trouble for using the word terrorist. <laughs> Again, on the radio. Um, also, OWLS, Old Wise Lesbians, was a very active and, and visible group in town where older lesbians met and, and did projects and just enjoyed the company of each other. I also started a women's health class at this time. And for the part of the readings for the women's health class, I used Mary Daly, the lesbian <laughs> philosopher. And she had a piece in here that I just wanted to share. On the boundaries of the male-centered universities, there is a flowering of woman-centered thinking. Gynocentric method requires not only the murder of misogynistic methods, intellectual and affective exorcism, but also ecstasy, which I have called ludic celebration. This is the free play of intuition in our own space giving rise to thinking that is vigorous, informed, multidimensional, independent, creative, and tough. It arises from the lived experience of being. And um, from that ludic celebration of gynocentric thinking, we addressed women's issues. And my textbook for that was Our Bodies, Our Health, Ourself, which was also a very subversive and radical book and got me in trouble. Um, <laughs> I had a, a, sec, uh, a section of that class on lesbian health issues, excuse me. And uh, one day I got a call from the vice president's office on campus, and they asked me to come in. And they said that they, I was in trouble, well, I wasn't in trouble, but they said that they had heard that I was teaching about lesbians in the classroom. I said, well, yeah. <laughs> what else is new? Mm -hmm. and, uh, they, and they asked me to bring my syllabus from that section and talk about and, uh, what I was teaching in my lesbian health section. And after I discussed this with Afesha Adams, who is one of the heroes. Is Afesha on there? No. Yes. yes. Oh, yeah, Afesha. Right there. Right there. Um, Afesha said to me, you know, you ought to do more of that. And I thought again, Thank you, University, and thank you, Afesha. Be and I did. And the more, the merrier. Gail Ruzica, again, <laughs> was on my case all the time. She uh, went to the Attorney General of the state and said that my textbooks were pornographic and that, and that I was breaking the law in teaching human sexuality in my women's health class because if some of my students were under the age of 18, then I was breaking the law by teaching them all those things that are against the law to teach young people. Again, the university, well, they asked to look at my textbook, which is the, was the major human sexuality textbook used in the country and uh, has nothing in it that wasn't anatomically correct. And, and so 
they, I got, you know, everything went fine with that. Um, I just, I do have one other little quick story. I also, in my women's health class, had the university, the nursing, the medical school has a gynecology program where women do self, <laughs> where they teach the doctors how to do pelvic exams. And so, Coral Mangus, <laughs> I forgot to put Coral up there, she's like major. <laughs> Coral Mangus came to my women's health class to do self-exam. Now I had prepared the class, I told, there were a few men in my class, I told them they couldn't come. <laughs> that, I shouldn't use that term, they couldn't attend. <laughs> they, um, that, uh, and that anyone who didn't want to attend, didn't have to, that was not required, it was, anyway. Well, the next day or so, the chair of my department, who was then Glenn Richardson, called me in. And he said, uh, Penny, I just got a call, and um, I was, they said that you had someone masturbating in your class last night. I said, damn, I missed it. <laughs> uh, so, but he also, they, my department was so kind to me. He also, when I explained to him, we did self-exam, that I had, you know, what I had done, he said, that's fine, and we moved on to whatever. Okay, uh, I just have to, how yeah. do you prepare if you know Coral Mangus is coming to the class? Well, it was the first <laughs> time she had come, so I wasn't prepared. Okay. <laughs> okay. And then by the second time, I was, you know, I had taken drugs, and I was calm, calmer. Um, I also want to just acknowledge Kim Russo, who is the direct, uh, who is the editor of Triangle newspaper, which was an important medium mm -hmm. for our community. And hell, I guess that's it. I guess that's sort of my story. But I wanted to leave you with a final piece. Uh, and this isn't the whole poem, but these are parts. And this is called "Where Will You Be" by Pat Parker. And I've always felt that our greatest mistakes were acts of omission. Not the things that we do, but the things that we don't do when we should be doing something. And this poem kind of said this to me. <laughs> Where Will You Be by Pat Parker, Black Lesbian, written about 1978. And as I reread this a number of times during the week, I realized that it's as fitting today as it was in the 80s and the 90s that Pat Parker was right on top of this. Boots are being polished, trumpeters clean their horns, chains and locks forged. The crusade has begun. Citizens, good citizens, all parade into voting booths and in self-righteous sanctity ex away our right to life. They will not come a mob rolling through the streets, but quickly and quietly move into your homes and remove evil, the queerness, the faggotry, the perverseness from their midst. Where will we be when they come? And they will come. Every time we watched a queer hassled in the streets and said nothing, it was an act of perversion. Every time we lied about the boyfriend or girlfriend at coffee break, it was an act of perversion. Every time we put on proper clothes to go to a family wedding and left our lovers at home, it was a perversion. And it won't matter if you're homosexual, not a faggot, lesbian, not a dyke, Gay, not queer. It won't matter if you're black, Chicano, Native American, Asian, or white. It won't matter if you're butcher femme, not into roles, monogamous, non-monogamous. It won't matter. They will come. They will come to the cities and to the land, to your front rooms and into your closets. They will come for the perverts. And where will you be when they come? And that's my story. <laughs> Dr. Patty Reagan, uh, in 1999, got the Christian Reese Community Service Award from at Pride Day of 1999. Thank you. And she was so humble about it. She didn't think she deserved it. She said it was for must have been for past good deeds. Well, to to me, all her life has been good deeds. Thank you, Ben. Would anybody else like to add to that little history or anything you like? I'll add a little piece of history. Mona. Yeah, so. 
Uh, I've known Patty since we were both at BYU. I mean, you were at BYU first. I came afterwards. I, I should have learned from you. But um, uh, it was it was really um, really fun to meet you because for me, growing up in Provo, I thought that there were no lesbians, and I thought I was the only one that had this feeling. And then I met you, and there was something about you that I was like. Again, why didn't you tell me? I know, we should have talked to each other. We should have talked. But then I remember coming to the U, and you know, it was at a time when uh, being gay, being a lesbian was, I mean, even though everybody on the basketball team were mostly all lesbians, we didn't tell each other much. You know, we'd see each other at the bars and stuff. Um, I remember, Patty, you were such an influence on all of us because there was such a professionalism about you and such a joy and an energy uh, of being around you that I always felt really wonderful to be in your presence. And I remember, um, I was a student of yours, I was a friend of yours, and, and, and we still are, and, uh, but I was a student of yours in the women's, uh, the human sexuality class, which made me so nervous. <laughs> and we were all sitting in there so quiet, because you know we're all college kids, and, and I remember one day you said to us, okay, let's just, let's just get comfortable with, with each other, and she said, Let's write up all the names we can think of of all the things that you call your female anatomy parts. So let's just, so I'm ready. And it was dead silence. We're all just like, oh. And she said, so he said, vagina. And she was like, good, that's really good. And she wrote that. And nobody had said anything. And then she looked right at me and she goes, pussy, right, that's right. I don't remember that. Down in, but you just had a way of uh, you were you were so brilliant for all of us to have a place to be, even if it was just to sit quietly in your class and to grow courage in your classrooms and in being in your presence. You were wonderful for Thank us. Thank you very much. You were a safe place for us. Thank you very much. Um, I just have to do a shout out for BYU. Um, 1981, 1982. Their women's intramurals was the best meetup I've ever seen. <laughs> 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 oh, a generation. We were a generation late. A decade late. Someone else said they had been? Yeah, or the uh, Rocky? Go ahead, Rocky. Go ahead, Ben. You had Lynette uh, Molstrom on your list there. And I just was going through my past year, and I re remember that she was in my family home evening group at BYU. Oh, oh that's funny. And I used to home teach her and I couldn't. Okay, how many here went to BYU? <laughs> oh my goodness, out of the closet again. <laughs> I don't think mine count because I was age 12. <laughs> yeah, that doesn't count. Okay. Rocky, did you have something more? Well, I had just, you know, fled from Zion in horror in 1994, and ended up at the Wolf Creek Radical Fairy Sanctuary. Oh, yeah. <laughs> staying there for a week and met this gorgeous, hunky Viking with a long beard and long hair and a rusty He's veil. not talking about me, I just want you to look. <laughs> rusty veil through his nose and he goes, you're from Utah. Yeah, I'm, G I'm Gary Reagan. I goes, are you related to Patty? That's my sister. <laughs> <laughs> Can you tell us a little more about your brother Gary, if you, if you can? I know it's you know, I didn't know my brother very well. He was younger, a year and a half younger, and he was a radical fairy. And when I went to Africa, I went to Africa, to Malawi, to do AIDS education. And in Malawi, this is, this is sort of a Gary story. And in Malawi, women had to wear skirts. It was, they're a British colony, and for, they were a little primitive, and you had to wear a skirt. Again, Francis Farley should have warned me again, I did not own a skirt. Gary lent me his skirts, <laughs> which I wore to Africa. They were very nice. And uh, I looked very cute in my ball cap, my hiking boots, and my skirt. Um, he, he died of HIV AIDS in 2001. He lived with HIV AIDS for about 15 years. And he was, uh, he was a nice man, very nice man. But none of the work I did with HIV AIDS at that time, I had no idea. I had gone to visit him in the late 80s, and he was very ill. And I remember going home to my mother and saying, and he didn't say anything about having AIDS. And I said, you know, Mom, um, Gary is just not looking very good. I, it did not even compute in my head that my brother had HIV AIDS. And um, we never, we were not that close, and so we never really talked about it. But that was so funny when you told me you had met 
my brother, <laughs> when I went to visit him to get my skirts, they were all naked at the little ranch, <laughs> as I recall. It was another little piece of sex education for me. <laughs> I think... Okay, Chris. Well, I was remembering, so I had human sexuality, and of course that was such an eye-opening class for all of us, and um, the first time a lot of us, I think, heard many of those terms, definitely out loud. So it was a game changer, life changer. But then as we were sitting here, it's so funny, because I started to think, I think I had another class with her, and I think she had a human model with a speculum, and we looked... That was coral. I know. <laughs> so, yeah, I, I was thinking it before you said it, but so I took we that were class masturbating too. in class. <laughs> I can't believe you forgot I, that. I missed that part too, but um, <laughs> but yeah, that was so. I mean, it was so revolutionary. You know? It was amazing. I yeah. just want. I think we should answer this. I just want to say that it was the women's community that really stepped up when the gay men's community in Salt Lake. Uh, in Utah was faltering because the state wasn't there. They wouldn't give us any money. They would, you know, they wouldn't do it. It all came from ourselves. We built these organizations, and it was the women that really stepped up to take care of us when we couldn't take care of ourselves. So, you know, we always owe a debt to the Women's Resource Center and the women's community and things like that for what they did for us back then. They were not only subversive, they were direct. And, and to do those two things in the same time is sort of amazing that all these women's organizations were subversive and direct at the same time. Excellent point. Thank you for your generosity in coming tonight on this cold night and for your patience in putting up with me after so many years of not talking. I really Close with one more Patty Reagan story because I and also we are going to ask you kind of to clear out the room so that we have to do a little bit of Patty business. We have to get her social security number, credit card. Do a oh, yeah. <laughs> That's right. Oh, so on that notoriously wonderful series that we were doing on the, the sex education on concerning gays and lesbians, and Patty being just candid, well I had one of my younger, much younger sisters attending, sitting outside. She was 18 and listening in and stuff. I finally brought her in the room and said, okay, have any questions? We'd take, turn the t tape off for a minute. And she said, what is this word? What is masturbation? Oh. So I turned the tape back on. <laughs> Patty described it in the most intimately perfect detail that I actually considered smoking. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Patty. Oh, you're welcome. <laughs> One more thing. One more thing? <laughs> yeah. We, oh, that's right. Not everybody was here when I did the intro. Next <clears throat> month, a week early, not the day before Thanksgiving, the week before that. The 20th. Yeah. Uh -huh. And Walter Larrabee. And remember, with Walter Larrabee, if he offers to reach out and touch you, he can do it. <laughs> Who Thank is you. Walter Larrabee? Oh, Walter Larrabee. Drag queen in Utah. The Empress 18. Empress, okay, and true drag, I mean amazing drag. He actually was hired and did for pay drag in like Branson, Missouri, Reno. You want to hear his, and he's so amazing, and he's, uh, and, and he's, He's a fairy. He's a fairy. He, he managed to dress me in drag the first time. And he did such a hell of a good job that my girlfriend came in late, was at the other end of the room. And I'm up on the stage doing the thing, I'm talking with my real voice, this voice, you know, the one that everybody knows. And she said, where the hell is Becky? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, all of you. Thank you, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> all right, I'll see you. Thank you for coming.